Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is former Marine, magician, and now vicar, Tim Sayed. Tim Sayer, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, Canon J. John, it's wonderful to be here. It, we've been friends for a, a long time. We've we have. worked together and uh, it's great to have you on the programme to tell us your story. Where were you born, Tim? I was born in a little fishing village on the north west coast of England called Liverpool. You might know it, John, it's on the lovely little town. Yeah, so I was born in Liverpool. Uh, my dad worked in the Cavern Club at the time as the road manager for the Mersey Beats. And you then went into the Marines. How old were you when you were? So I joined the Royal Marines at uh, 17 as a junior Marine. And uh, you do a three day test to see if you can make it. 12 of us joined, three passed. And then I joined in November 1982 for my commando training. I did 34 weeks at the commando training center down in Exmouth. How was life in the Marines? Um, it depends on what you would quote as normal life. So a normal life for a commander, these guys are not your regular men. They're very sort of uh, fun loving. They are, take extreme risk and what we would call adverse uh, weather or conditions they would call normal. They sort of train in very unusual places. And I was at 4-5 commando. After training, they set me up mountain Arctic warfare and I spent all my training mostly in the mountains of Scotland, uh, abroad and in the Arctic. I did five Arctic winters out in Norway. How long were you in the Marines for? Just under six years. Uh, and I got out in 1988. Then what did you do? Um, well, in those days, there wasn't the, the kind of security work there is nowadays. So I got into the ski industry and I was doing magic tricks as a hobby. I did seven winters when I got out and in the summers I did professional magic and then did magic in the ski resorts as well in the evening. And um, your illusion magic career yes. Yes. Um, was quite amazing really. Did it surprise you at how um, <laughs> promising it became? Well I think when, you, when the average person that gets out of the military, unless you have a, a, a trade, you're looking for, to grab anything you can to work. And what I realised was I had a sort of natural affiliation to rapport build and to do tricks. So I practised six hours a day and I got a lucky break because I was offering to work for the Magic Circle in London. And uh, they sent me to, uh, to do a free job for Bill Wyman's new restaurant called Sticky Fingers in London. And I met a guy from home and away there called Paul Robinson, who is, uh, people might know home and away if they watch it. And he persuaded this woman to take me on and she managed all these people. And so she said, can I be your manager? And I went from that to movie premieres, uh, started working at movie premieres. I worked for Formula One, McLaren and for Bernie Eccleston. And I worked at, as Ar at Arsenal for over 20 years as the one of the magicians there. And the England squad, the FA, you know, it just came and the TV came in. I was doing all sorts of television, having lots and lots of fun. So all very successful. How did you discover faith in Christ? Well, I think um, people often say you have to have a crisis, but it wasn't a crisis for me. There was a sense of something was missing. I was driving past churches often and thought they were all the same, but I noticed they said Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Anglican, whatever. And I thought, I need to find out about that. I had not done a military church in Windsor. And uh, just as it happened, the, the vicar was an ex Royal Navy chaplain. And I just said, look, I feel like a dummy. I have no idea. I couldn't hold a conversation on, on faith. Have you got any courses for like idiots, you know, for the beginners? And he said, yeah, we got an alpha course. And I said, well, what do I need? He said, nothing. I said, do you get a meal? He said, yeah. Um, being a bachelor, I thought, well, you get a free meal. So I signed up for that course. And uh, on the video, on the course, um, I found it great. They had these lovely people. But on the video, they had these very young, attractive ladies. 
uh, from a church in London called Holy Trinity Brompton. And they all seemed to be very happy about faith. So I thought I'd pop down there one day and I went into this church and saw hundreds and hundreds of people looking up in the sky because my experience, John, was when you go to church, you're bored and all you do is try and work out when the service will end and where the exit is. But this time people were there looking like they were meaningfully speaking to someone and they wanted to be there and they looked very, very happy. And while I was there, I suddenly started feeling sad and started like crying, you know, and I, this guy said to me, what's happening is you've had years and years of stuff, you've got unforgiveness and pain and trauma and God wants to heal it and bring it out. And I thought he's mad, you know, they've drugged the tea. <laughs> <laughs> it drug the tea. <laughs> but I went back the week after and it happened again. I signed up there at Holy Trinity Brompton and on the course I found faith in, in Jesus. And being a, someone who used to be a professional magician, I say for our guest magician, it was sleight of hand only, tricks and illustrations that I did, nothing else. Um, I was hard to fool. But I realised on the Alpha course on the weekend away that there was a God and he was real, and I was convinced that I needed to follow him, and I've done that with my whole life ever since. Well, how did that change your life, Tim? Well, first of all, I, I think most of the time I would bury my disappointments and hurts and habits and hang-ups. I'd bury the traumas of the past. I would self-medicate on beer, partying, girls' gadgets and gold, uh, food, and I would basically try and distract myself from what was really going on in my heart. What I realised was when I met Jesus through this course that this was a, wasn't some airy fairy bloke with, with uh, rabbits and sheep around him, that this was a man who lived on earth who was bringing a message that God loved me and the world and he was willing to do whatever it took and he was tough. He was tough to, to live the life he did and end his life on that cross. And I thought, I've got respect for him as a soldier. I can respect this guy and follow him. And I'm used to following good leaders and bad leaders, but I recognise a good leader to follow. And now you're a, a vicar, you're a pastor of a local church. Yes, I know, it's astonishing. Um, and it's a sign that God will give anybody the opportunity to, to change and be transformed uh, with their life. I realised that uh, I needed help to change and to be transformed. I spent most of my life believing I knew how to meet my needs. And what God did is changed me. And he led me into the direction of him, which was through the church. And it was astonishing how that happened. I remember going to Oxford, not having a clue how to do essays at high level, having to have lessons. Then my preaching, I was awful. I had to get taught how to read to preach from the beginning and then I came to, I worked with you for a while, didn't I? And I was yes. awful at evangelism, but you saw some potential and uh, you trained me. And I think one of the things I learned in the military is to, to take instruction and learn. It will save you a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. Well, what would be great, Tim, if you could explain to our viewers, what is the gospel? What is the good news of Jesus Christ? And illustrate that to us using illusion? I'd love to. So if you're watching at home now, you might be like me many years ago thinking, I'm not convinced. I'm not here to convince you. It's God that does that. But I want to show you something. You know, I thought that I knew it all, or for me, what would make me happy. And um, what I have is a £10 note. And I thought I would know how to bring value into my life. But as I follow Jesus, I've realised that he and only he does the transf transformation. I needed to know forgiveness of God uh, towards myself, towards others who I'd hurt. Have you hurt people? I've hurt people. And then I was angry at God if he existed and I'd obviously hurt him. And I realised I needed to, in my language, fess up and say, I'm sorry, I was out of order. And what I realised was that when I do that, I'm just going to show you this really slowly. As I do that, I was transformed from one to another. But what I noticed was that God doesn't just change us. He transforms us and brings 
incredible value. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. He took me from one place to another, transformed me from the inside. So I need to say sorry. So I started saying sorry to people I'd hurt, sorry to God. And you know, we often hurt ourselves. So God came to help us make good the things we've done wrong. Jesus came because God said, look, you know, if you want to know me, we've got to wipe the slate clean and get right in our relationship and right with me. So that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing is I remember uh, God saying to me, you know, if you want to know me, you have to have friendship with me. And there's nothing better than the friends I made in the Royal Marines at the time. This is my commando beret, which you earn when you pass out of training. You see, I remember being on a march once and it was really tough. And sometimes the lactic acid kicks in your legs and you struggle. And I was carrying the machine gun, the GPMG at the time, and I was tired. I don't know why. And some of the guys started taking the kit out of my backpack just so I could get my strength back. That was quite a humbling moment. There was no shame in that. Although these guys would, would have a lot of fun and take the mickey, there was no shame. And then when I got my strength back, they put it in. And what I realized is Jesus didn't just come to wipe the slate clean. He didn't come to tell us off. He came to say, I love you. You have incredible potential. And to fulfill that, you need to know God. At the end of that march, nothing was said, but I realized that Jesus, like those men even more, has got my back and he's got your back. And he, he gives you it and he watches your back and he watches over you. And he wants you to let him in. That's the whole purpose of the gospel, the good news. That's what it means. I've got a, a Rubik's Cube here. I don't know if you've uh, ever used a Rubik's Cube. I spent years and years trying to work out how to do one of these. I naturally never really learned without the book. I just want to imagine for all those who are watching that all these colours are all the different people from all over the world. And then if you look at all these colours, all these could be all the things you see in yourself. And the white was the good things I did and all the others. It was, there's lots of anger and control and manipulation. I thought to make myself big, I would speak down. And when I met Jesus, he says, I've come to say to you, you don't have to stick up for yourself anymore. I'm going to do that for you. Uh, and what I learned is that Jesus comes and he starts making things new. He puts your life and my life in order. He helps us understand our significance, our security and self-worth, where we're from, why we're here and where we're going. He gives you a neat me direction. I was am amazed by that. And then when I met him and he transformed my life and he can do it for you, then he basically filled me with a light inside me that I could not explain, which was life changing. And what he says is I want to fill you so much with my love, your body, you are made in my image. You're made for love, you are made for love. And I want you to go and pass on that love to others as a gift. So I learned that. And then there was this thing about the future. How does Jesus transform us? Well, it's a bit like this. I'd just like to do two illustrations, if I may, to finish Absolutely. this, John. So I have two ropes here. I used to think that this was God and this was me. And when I do good things, I get closer to God. And when I do bad things, or I'm a baddie, as my children say, I walk away from God. But what I realized was that's not what God was saying. God was saying, I want to wipe the slate clean, make you right with me. And I will fill you with love so that I will take you from the inside and you and I will become one. And what will happen is it will be so seamless, so invisible, you won't even notice it but I will be with you and you won't have to do good things. I will be doing it through you. I will give you a hope for the future. And I've got one more illustration to explain that. I have here some coal in a cup. And I don't know what you think when you see coal. I don't know what you think. Is it for burning? Did you know that coal or diamonds are made from coal? And coal in itself is not worth much, but a diamond, as we know, is worth a lot. But that transformation from coal to a diamond has to come 
in a very, very powerful way. Huge forces are put around the coal over a period of time to transform it into a diamond. Many of you there might be thinking, well, I have no value. I'm not going to make a difference in my lifetime or in this world. I can't impact others. But God has never made you for coal. He doesn't see you as a piece of coal. He sees you as having incredible value, incredible worth. You're made in his image. You were made for love. And your whole body, mind and soul, that's your body as well, is made to give love. So we take a piece of coal. When you follow Jesus, this red colour thing represents this thing about in the church, we talk about the blood of Jesus. When he died, everything changed in the world. And that means for me and you, life has hope. And that means we become living diamonds. And we see our true value in the eyes of God. And we go out and pass his love and worth for the whole human race to others. It's really exciting. Don't be a piece of coal, be a diamond. Tim, if there's anyone um, listening now and they would love to take the invitation, or maybe they did in the past, but then they've shelved it, but they'd like to pick it up today. Can you lead um, anyone that would like to to receive that invitation now. Thank you, John, I, that, I would love to do that. Listen, I don't know what, where you're at in your life at the moment. I don't know what you're struggling with. I'm sorry if life's hard. I'm sorry if you feel life's tough. You might be grieving, you might be ill, you might be disappointed, you might be struggling in marriage or in parenting or in work or with money. Whatever you face, I promise you this, God who made you is with you. He knows you, every part of you he loves you and he wants to help. All you have to do is do what I did all those years ago. I was self-sufficient and I realised that will never get me what I need. Don't be self-sufficient. So why don't you say this prayer with me? It's a simple prayer really, but it will change your life. Would you like that? Should we do it together? Okay, I just want you to close your eyes. You don't even have to, but maybe it will help. And say these words after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for all the things I've done wrong that have offended you, hurt you, hurt others, wronged others, hurt myself and wronged myself. Something may come to mind, but that's okay. Just give it to him. I'm sorry, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Thank you for your forgiveness. It's that quick, that's what happens. Lord Jesus, would you come into my heart by your Holy Spirit and would you lead me now to the life you've always purposed for me? I may not know all the answers yet, I may not know the direction, but I trust you with my life. Restore me and transform me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you did pray that prayer, a prayer for you, Father, for every person that prayed that prayer, either for the first time or as a way of reaffirming their faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, we announce and we pronounce his forgiveness over you. May you know Christ's presence and peace. And we pray for your protection as you focus and build your life on him. And we pray that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Tim. If somebody prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time or as a way of reaffirming their faith, and for all of us, what do we need to do to grow as Christians? You're a pastor, Tim, so you're looking after a flock. You're encouraging your flock to keep on keeping on. What is your advice? The first thing is to tell somebody you've made this decision. You cannot support Arsenal Football Club, my football club, or whatever sport you like and enjoy it as much as if you're with other people who enjoy it like you. 
There's something about following Arsenal. When I go to the club, I'm surrounded by other supporters. And when we score a goal, we celebrate. You cannot be a follower of Jesus alone. You need to get involved with the local church. But it has to be one where when you enter, your heart doesn't sink, but is leaping for joy. And you will know God will guide you. Get involved with the local church. Try and get yourself on a course, Alpha course or any course on an introduction to faith. Buy some books and try and get to know some Christians who can help you and guide you. And maybe go to the pastor of the church and say, I've just become a Christian. Can you help me? What you mustn't do is do nothing because we don't want you to be sidetracked or lose focus on this great adventure God has for you. And what about prayer and Bible reading? So I would recommend someone read the book of John. If you've got a, a Bible, grab a New Testament if you can. You can download it on your phone. There are plenty of them you can get which are free. And um, read through in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Go to the book of John and read that through. And then my, maybe try, uh, a, I remember reading a book, if you're someone who likes reading, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis is a great book. Or Nicky Gumbel's Questions of Life. I read Nikki's book when I became a follower of Jesus and at the end of reading that book I got down on my knees and asked Jesus to come into my life. These are great beginner books to get you thinking more about what you've just started doing. And life, there are always storms and when the storms come, uh, you as a you're both a pastor and an evangelist, but as a pastor, what encouragement would you give us all um, as we follow Jesus uh, when we're encountering all these storms? Well, I would say that, um, first of all, to recognize what season you're in. Sometimes you're in a season of restoration. Sometimes you're in a season of change. Sometimes you're in a season of, of uh, transformation and education. It's recognising where you are and not fighting against that season. So if someone tells me they're about to have a baby, I know they're going to have a season of a huge unsettling, of joy, sleepless nights, you know, and you can't avoid that. So recognise where you are and try not to fight it and, and be happy with your situation if you feel that you can't change the circumstances, but you can ask God. The second thing is seek help if you have mental health problems. We want to take stigma and shame away from that. Speak out and be honest. Don't let shame or past trauma stop you from seeking restoration and healing. Sometimes the church can pray for you, but be willing to go for counselling if you need it. A lot of people I meet, John, are um, feeling uh, they should avoid things like counselling and help, that they should have to work it out themselves. We weren't, we weren't meant to work out things ourselves. We were meant to help each other work them out with God's guidance. So I always say to people, it takes courage to ask someone to help you in your life. If your marriage is a problem, seek help. Don't stay silent. We want to see people emotionally and spiritually mature, not just spiritually mature. And then how do we discern, Tim, the will of God um, guidance. How do we know uh, that the Lord is our shepherd? How do we discern that it's his voice that we should follow? So when I'm speaking at a conference and there might be hundreds of people there, if my wife coughs, I hear it. If I, my wife coughs and I don't hear it, I will hear it later. What's interesting is you tend to tune into the voices you think are important. We need to learn to tune into the voice of God. And how we do that is through the scriptures, through the Bible. That is real treasure. And he will speak. As you read the text, you'll start having a sense of I should do this or I need to do that or this is what I should do. So reading the text of the Bible, the New Testament and Old, but the New first, will give you guidance. The second is you get a prompting. You get no peace about something. And if you do it, you get peace about it. So there's that. And there's other people asking people, what do you think I should do? If they're Christians, they've got wisdom, ask them to help you discern what you should do. So there's three things for guidance. The prompting through prayer, 
other Christians and certainly the Bible. Now we know, Tim, that the Lord guides our steps and he guides our stops. And sometimes we don't like it when he stops us, do we? No, no. I, um, you know, I can be as stuck as anybody and selfish. And sometimes we set our mind, someone said once, what we believe will meet our needs becomes our goal. And when someone blocks our goal, the consequential emotion is anger. But actually God stops us from something. And if we get angry, we get angry, but often it's to protect us because he knows the outcome of where we go. So sometimes God says go, sometimes God says stop. And it's learning to trust that, that comes through experience. Uh, and the lines might be blurred, but make sure you ask others to help you. Is God saying go or stop? And if he says stop, don't have an adult tantrum because we do have them sometimes, don't we? It might not be like a child where we have throw things, but we can have an internal adult tantrum. And actually it's being at peace with the direction and the speed that God guides us is important. Otherwise, you'll just start causing yourself all sorts of angst and anxiety. There, there's a scripture that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And it's very important for us as followers of Jesus not to be ashamed of talking about our faith. What encouragement would you give us? Well, I think I meet a lot of people that are struggling to communicate their faith. We live in a world, uh, we've moved into a sort of season now where it's actually not, it's not on vogue to speak and say you're a Christian. My advice is for people to, they don't have to learn how to do evangelism, that's not the point. But every single one of us is called to be a witness. Any one of us at any point could be called to go to court and give uh, evidence as a witness for something we've seen. It might be a car accident, it might be this. And all we can do is say what we've seen. Every one of us in this day and age can give witness to what God has done in our own life. That's all he's asking us to do. If we're not an evangelist, just be a witness. Now that can be in the things you do, the things you say, in the way you act. And if you want to be the best witness, fill yourself up with the word of God the love of God and pray. So when you go out, you are God's hand and feet to the world. Tim, it's a joy to have you on Facing the Canon. You're always very inspiring, a, a great tonic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for asking me. Tim Sayet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Hope that's inspired you, encouraged you in your own journey of faith. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.